Thanks very much. So, um, just a, a, a tiny bit of background. Blast Theory is a group of artists. We're based here in Brighton in the rather attractive bungalow-looking building in the industrial area. And uh, we've been working together since 1991. And uh, a key part of our practice, the development of the work that we've been making, is a collaboration with the Mixed Reality Lab at the University of Nottingham, uh, who have been a very uh, sort of seminal part of us beginning to get to uh, a, a grasp of technology and thinking about the ways in which technology might affect the work that we make. In terms of the work that we make, it's fairly diverse, but it is always, nearly always happening in public space. Uh, this photo here is from uh, a piece of our work being shown in Cologne, and uh, the man running in the middle there is taking part in a game called Can You See Me Now? And here's a bunch of uh, Cologne kids who have joined in to take part on the, in, in that game. We try and make work that somehow sits on the boundary between popular culture and social and political realities and thinking about how these two things are intertwined and that will become sort of more um, evident as I talk about a machine to see with. Thinking about how technology reconfigures relationships which to you after listening to the presentations we've had so far needs no real setup or introduction. And the, the slightly grand overblown fourth point, our estimate epistemological crisis wrought, wrought by ubiquitous mediation, which is more uh, 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 just a way of talking about how in, the, in, in our media age, our sense of how we understand and get to grips with the world around us is, is ever more heavily mediated, we're ever heavily more distanced from uh, the world around us, and that creates profound changes to the ways in which we think about our understanding of the world, you know, how we gather information and make sense of it. We need dramatically more critical tools than we had in the past to be able to, 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 uh, to grapple with that. I thought about that very much in, the, in this morning's session when we were sort of talking about sort of a seamless versus seamful understanding of technology, and it sort of really struck me that in a way you know, capitalism is about a kind of frictionless view, you know, that people who are in control, the mo what they mo want most is a completely smooth and seamless sense of how things unfold and work, and that a lot of effort is put to covering those seams, those fractures, uh, uh, the, the kind of grit in the ways in which society is organised. So the work I'm going to talk about, a machine to see with, I will not be plugging it, you'll be glad to hear. Uh, but I thought it might be interesting, I haven't really done this before, but I thought it might be interesting just to reflect a little bit on how we kind of grappled with this particular commission and how it led us to create the work that we've made. Because we, it was an open call commission from a, a festival called Zero One in San Jose, the Banff New Media Institute, which is based in Canada, and Sundance Film Festival, a part of Sundance called New Frontier, for a piece of locative cinema. And uh, none of us in Blast Theory had any idea what locative cinema was, and even Google didn't seem to really know what locative cinema was, but there was money and it was Sundance, and we do things that involve location, and we're like, right, well, we'll be going for this then, and we just better do a quick you know, busk on what locative cinema would actually involve. Uh, the, the commission said, uh, the purpose is, is to use locative cinema as an apparatus through which artists can share their vision using place in ways that are both specific and generic, or at least transferable. The Commission understands the notion of locative cinema as a platform agnostic apparatus through which artists share their vision of place. Not necessarily any degree wiser after we dealt with that, but we came up with a, a proposal and put this proposal in, uh, and then got contacted by the commissioners to say, you know, we're interested in your commission, but we'd like to have a conference call with the, the six commissioners and for you to talk in more detail about your idea. And at that point, we were like, oh, now we are really in trouble because there is no way we are going to get through a conference call where the fact that we have no idea what locative cinema is really is, is something that we can, we can establish. Fortunately, no one ever asked. So we were able to busk our way through that. And we, we got this commission uh, for the princely sum of 5,000 US dollars, I should hasten to add. So, you know, the glamour was not necessarily backed up by the, by the, uh, by the royalty. Um, and so then, you know, then the real problem started of like, okay, now we actually have to kind of understand in what way we can make a piece of work that would, that would operate in a cinema. And we started to think about, you know, where, what, where, does, where does cinema operate between the screen and your eye and your mind? 
ha as, as you make something that's locative and you're moving around, the screen itself is in an unstable relationship with you. It may be closer or further. It may be moving. It may be a screen that you can, can control. You may have control over playback. You know, what does all that do to cinematic? Because cinematic, in, in my mind, is something that is about scale and breadth and grandeur and immersion and all of those things are badly broken as soon as you're dealing with some poxy little screen and you're in the street with noise that you can't control and things like that. Uh, and most, most specifically about location or I, I would clarify that to think about context because I think location really encourages us to think of sort of maps and a kind of a Cartesian understanding of space whereas context is a, is a much fuller term that incorporates the fact that we're in social and political sets of relationships as we move around not just spatial and geographic ones and that these things are all present you know, they're all bound up with it you know the fact that we're in a, an X you know, stables for a royal dandy. You know, that's part of the way. That's part of what informs the the, the building that we're that we're in today. And uh, being simple people, we always start with very simple things, with a very uh, you know strong belief that you start with the the crap idea, and that until you've got through the crap idea, you're going nowhere. So you might as well just get it out. You know, spill spill it accept that it was rubbish, and then you can, can, can move on. And the first things that we did was, was saying, OK, well, what that is cinematic could we do on the streets of Portslade uh, that would be, you know, that, that engages that kind of cinematic uh, uh, imagination? Uh, you know, we, were, we, were, we, we reflected a lot, and a lot of our work has been informed by this idea that we, are, we have this kind of constant... Uh, in engagement with visual images that absolutely overwhelm and inscribe our imagination in loads of ways. You know, how many romantic kisses had you witnessed before you kissed someone romantically for the first time? All of that stuff is inscribed within you. You have a set of expectations and understandings about what romantic kissing looks like. And, you know, for God forbid, we all have, you know, until you start having sex, you think, if you've seen Hollywood films, you've got a very truncated and limited sense of what sex would actually involve. You know, so, you know, for me, the real great example in the UK is, you know, when we think about a yellow school bus, you know, we, we all understand what yellow school buses look like and how they, you know, how they operate and what they do. They, they have a whole set of properties for us, even though that most of us would never have clapped eyes on a, on a, school, a yellow school bus until we, until we travelled. So we started to do things, simple things, where you're, you're, this cinematic Im uh, uh, imagination is engaged, all those kind of tropes and genre cliches are kind of invoked just through the act of starting to follow someone down the street or staking out uh, a, a, a building, just putting someone under surveillance. So we just played with those things and then reflected on in what way that kind of, uh, that, that invoked a certain atmosphere for us. And it very quickly became clear that we didn't need a screen. You know, that actually what you want is something that it deals with the fact that it's, it's an imaginative process. And um, that, was a, that was a kind of dramatic kind of uh, uh, unlocking for us in terms of how we thought. Uh, so, as you can see, the, the work is, is um, people take part on their own phones. It's a series of automated phone calls. It uses a, a piece of open source call center software called Asterisk. And then we wrote a very small amount of code just for automating and structuring how calls were, were, were unfolding. And it's structured as a bank robbery. But to um, set a little bit more context about how that work came to take the form it did, I want to just sort of step back a little bit to a previous project of ours. In 2009, we made a piece of work called Ulrika and Eamon Compliance, which was a commission for the Venice Biennale, where we invited people to choose to take on the role of either Ulrika Meinhof from the Red Army faction, or a man called Eamon Collins, who was a member of the IRA in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and walk through Venice uh, inhabiting this role and ultimately deciding whether to go to a, a, a hidden room in a, in a, in a sort of uh, down, a, down an alley in an old church, an abandoned church, and submit to an interview uh, about, um, uh, the, well, that began with the question, what would you fight for? And the work hinges on this sort of ambivalence that you have between whether you're sort of adopting, fully adopting this persona, or whether you're sort of slightly resistant to it and step, keeping yourself outside of that, whether you are Ulrika or quite not Ulrika. But the, the sort of unlocking of that particular piece of work was coming across uh, the trolley dilemmas. I don't know how many people are familiar with, with trolley dilemmas. Could I just see a few show of hands? 
Okay, a few, a few people. Okay, so the, 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 the basic pro trolley dilemma is this, and this is a question that you may answer for yourself now, which is, a trolley is running out of control down a track. In its path are five people. You can flip a switch which will lead the trolley down a different track to safety. Unfortunately, there is a single person tied to that track should you flip the switch. So it's just a very simple moral question of whether you would be willing to kill someone in order to save five other people. And in that form, it seems quite straightforward. Most people, when asked, say, yes, I would flip the switch, which is an interesting thing in itself because, of course, that means that you're saying, yes, I would happily kill someone should, would, were the conditions correct to do so. There's, there's th this um, uh, um, formulation comes from a British philosopher called Philippa Foote from the late 1960s and has become so, uh, such a rich source of thinking about moral questions that the entire field of it is now apparently called trolleyology and there are <laughs> dozens and dozens of them. And they go on and on through a whole series of very interesting questions. That's Philippa herself, quite a fine looking woman, I think you'll agree. And, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, one of the subsequent versions of that, for example, is almost exactly the same as the one I just told you, but instead, this time, instead of flipping a switch, you have to push a fat man over a bridge onto the track in order to, to divert the trolley. And of course, you know, when you're asked, would you push the man o off the bridge to save the five people, the, you know, the percentage dramatically reduces. Most people find that a much harder thing to deal with. And it just it, it unlocked something for us in terms of making interactive work because it suddenly made it suddenly made it clear to us that when you when you put the member of the public up, uh, uh, as a protagonist within the work, if you can give them interesting and and awkward moral questions like this to enact rather than just hypothetically what would you do to put you in a position where you actually have to make that de decision yourself, even within the realm of a fictional experience, it's an interesting and unusual position to be placed in because normally as uh, 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 when, we, when we come to an artwork we're able to internalize our response to it and we're very rarely expected to make it clear outwardly how we would how we would respond. Jumping forwards again to a machine to see with armed with this sort of bit of this bit of knowledge from Ulrika and Aim and Compliant and thinking about how that might work here we started to look at the kind of real tropes of, of uh, of, of the, uh, the kind of heist movie. So we looked at, uh, you can see there's a little clip from, from Chinatown. Uh, I was very influenced by this book by Chris Hedges called The Empire of Illusion. And one of the quotes in that is, we try to see ourselves moving through our life as a camera would see us, mindful of how we hold ourselves, how we dress, what we say. We invent movies that play in our heads. Uh, I, you know, I might be outing myself, but to me that resonates very, very, very strongly. And we looked at this, this work, The Jugger, which is a kind of classic bit of film noir fiction, almost like the, the, you know, the archetypical heist, absolutely beautifully written piece of work by, by under the pen name of Richard Stark. And interestingly, this film, The Jugger, was stolen by Jean-Luc Godard for his film Made in USA, literally stolen, so much so that uh, Made in USA wasn't actually shown in the States during uh, Donald Westlake's life, who was the, the author of The Jugger, because uh, Godard never got permission. And interestingly, this film, uh, Made in USA, takes the plot of the, of, of the Jugger and then crashes it headlong into the Vietnam War and pretends throughout that it's set in Atlantic City, which is so self-evidently Paris, it is um, hilarious. And so it's playing very much with the line between fiction and, and reality, and very much between this kind of immersive cinematic tropes, you know, and for my money, the, all the greatest of those Godard films in the 60s walk this absolutely beautiful, delicate line between immersing you into all of those cinematic pleasures of the genre while constantly undermining you, pushing you, jumping you into different forms of contemplation, breaking your identification and, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to very great effect. A couple of other just kind of small sort of things I just want to mention that, that, that forms a very big part of how we came to, to, to work on this was the, the story of Bill Clinton's re-election campaign, thank you, in, in 1996 and particularly the role of a massive call center that was set up in Denver in order to ring thousands of swing voters every single day. And, and his, his electoral strategist, Dick Morris, set up this a very, very careful process of, of polling people through their phones, getting exact pictures of what they were doing and what they were interested in, not on a political level, on a kind of psychological level, and then looking for policies that would, that would strike uh, accords in that respect. It may seem kind of fatuous to say it, but of course, all of this takes place in the context of a kind of quite bizarre moment 
in, in world politics where you know, an, a, a small elite of people has, has stolen many, many hundreds of billions of, of pounds worldwide, more or less with impunity. And we've, we've had a real kind of lesson. We're still experiencing the real lesson of the limits of democratic power in the age of kind of global finance. And for me, you know, I feel quite profoundly disempowered by that. You know, I feel very, very impotent in relation to something that seems to me self-evidently you know, the, the, the kind of key issue that needs addressing. Uh, and so you can't make work that one deals with banks, bank robberies, money, but or, e even more sort of fundamentally deals with agency and power and how you, how you are invited to act and make decisions without in some way accepting that it's within that context. So the work really operates around inhabiting a role and there is a tension in, in, in works like this between interacting and taking decisions and sort of emotionally and intellectually engaging with the work. And naturally, you can do that very richly. This is what Sermar teaches us. You don't need to interact with something to be very deeply engaged by it. And there's a real tension in these sort of projects. So uh, there, there is a sort of design challenge, which is that either you have to sort of free participants as much as possible from the decision-making process so that they're not overloaded by trying to work out what to do, or make those decisions semantically important, make them meaningful in the context of the work. And that's a, a, a key part of how we've uh, addressed uh, a machine to see with. A machine to see with kind of promises a whole set of interactions. It's sort of set up as if it's kind of a deeply interactive work, but it's really not. It's really about sending you down very narrow rat runs, and there's very little way in which you can influence things. And, you know, I, I don't have time to sort of talk about it now, but that's in what, in, in, partly a reflection in the rise of interactive work and, and a thinking about how deeply ideological and how deeply structured most ideological works are to do exactly that. You know, they, that they promise you certain levels of agency, but in fact are not, are not really about that. And it's just something that kind of gnaws away at me about this balance between sort of empowering people and giving people choice and yet at the same time being honest about what level of choice is really on offer. So just finishing up, uh, you know, you're invited to make decisions within a fictional framework, but it's one that's spilling backwards and forwards out into the real world. You know, when you walk through the city engaged in this heist movie, you're absolutely alive to the real city all around you, but there's uncertainty about what those boundaries are. And, and, and in this project, we're really trying to make productive uh, 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 capital out of that ambiguity, that because you're uncertain where fiction ends and reality begins, that seems a very productive way in which to engage you with ideas around uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the financial crisis and about our, our agency within the world. One last thing is just to mention that if you are interested in this field of work, this book, Performing Mixed Reality, is just about to be published by the MIT Press, by Steve Benford and Gabriella, Gabriella Giannacci, uh, which talks about uh, understanding how uh, mixed reality performances might, might work. And the last thing I did, wanted to do was just finish on this quote from Jane Smiley, which I love very much. When I used to think of the word confusion, I would think of a kind of grey mist, but that is not what confusion is. Confusion is perfect sight and perfect mystery at the same time. Confusion is like seeing without knowing. Thanks very much.